And with that, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. This is a really interesting topic. Thanks, Grace. Uh, so I'd like to welcome everyone, first of all. And uh, well, Grace already, already introduced us. I don't think we have the time to actually make any more formal in introductions here. So the idea with this session is that we have cut it in three parts. We have an introductory part, uh, which Carlo will give, uh, which is uh, basically covering why we should do Bayesian data analysis. And then we have a slightly larger part in the middle, uh, which I will have, which will provide you with an example on how to do it after I've done a presentation. So that part con contains both a presentation and a live coding example. And then finally, we have a final uh, presentation, which Robert will have, uh, which will uh, be about, uh, well, basically about using patient data analysis and the processes and the iterative way we work with uh, patient models. Now, after each of these sessions, we will have a Q&A. So if you have any questions, wait until we've done the presentation and then we take all the questions after each session here. Uh, there are videos on GitHub uh, that, uh, that Carlo has now prepared, uh, which are a bit more polished than I guess uh, uh, this presentation will be. Uh, so you can always check that out. You can check on Carlo's uh, get, uh, YouTube account. And then of course, you also have a GitHub link, which I will show you later, uh, where you can clone a repository and start playing around with what I will cover um, in particular. And as always also, if you have any questions, if you have any, if you need any pointers or anything like that, then don't hesitate to reach out to me, Carl or Robert, and, and we'll point you to literature and books and, and give you tips and tricks if you're interested in starting using patient data analysis in your research. Now, uh, before we continue, Carlo, Robert, do you have anything to add? No, thanks, Richard. Uh, I think so, thanks. Okay, Carlo, the floor is yours. Great, and I just posted to the chat uh, the link to the play YouTube playlist with the videos that are, uh, they're not gonna be identical to what we're gonna present, but they're gonna be uh, very similar. Okay. All right. Great, so um, this first part is uh, really about the motivation for this whole endeavor. It's gonna be relatively, um, relatively brief. And um, it's it's a little bit like a pitch, so uh, it's not a it's not a surprise, uh, it's not a secret that uh, the three of us are very passionate uh, about uh, based on that analysis. We think it's a really um, valuable uh, set of uh, tools and techniques. And uh, in this talk, uh, I'm gonna uh, show you at a high level some of the advantages, some of the strength that it, that it has to offer, and. Uh, uh, later on, you will see also some of these points in a more practical setting with uh, Richard and also uh, final Robert's uh, uh, part. Um, however, uh, so the reason we are uh, so passionate about business analysis is not really ideological, uh, but it, it's more because we, we found practical advantages. And I think it's also, um, it's also fair to say that uh, um, uh, to start with, uh, with, a, with a brief discussion of what uh, um, some, some of the things that uh, Bayesian statistics uh, cannot do, or uh, perhaps it's more limited than uh, the alternative. And in this talk, uh, I will refer to non-Bayesian data analysis and non-Bayesian statistics. And I will call them either classical statistics or uh, frequent statistics. They're, they're not exactly synonyms, but um, they're just, they're just gonna mean non-Bayesian in this talk. So um, what are then the disadvantages? So what, what are settings, situations where Bayesian statistics may not be the ideal choice? I can think of at least uh, three um, reasons, uh, three scenarios if you want. So one is performance. So um, it, it is absolutely true that uh, the, uh, there's been a spectacular improvement of the performance of uh, Bayesian fitting algorithms over the last uh, uh, 10 or 20 years, or actually uh, stretches back even, even further. Um, and at the same time, of course, we're not like in, uh, in the uh, 1960s where uh, computational resources were very scarce. So nowadays we have much more access to um, relatively powerful uh, computational resources. However, it remains true that uh, usually on average, Bayesian uh, fitting techniques are more computationally expensive than frequentist ones. 
And uh, the reason is often that uh, in Prequitis one, there are often approximations that uh, have a closed form solution. And in sending business statistics, we typically reduce everything to a sampling process that can be efficient, but uh, still takes some time. So if you are really um, strapped with time, you need to analyze uh, huge models with thousands and thousands of variables and millions of data points in a very short amount of time, then you may not be able to do that using Bayesian techniques. So this is the first uh, possible disadvantage. The second one has to do with the effort that we have to put as user, if you want, of Bayesian statistics um, to, to, you to actually, uh, put them to use. Because as we will see in many different ways, uh, um, Bayesian statistics and Bayesian analysis really emphasizes the modeling part of uh, uh, data analysis. So it's not just apply about applying uh, predefined formulas, but it's about really thinking about what aspects of data you want to model, what aspects you can extract, and so on. And so this is ultimately an advantage, but it also requires uh, more investment upfront. So we cannot just reuse, uh, in many cases, we cannot reuse something that was ready-made. Um, the third uh, uh, reason that I think is, uh, is one where uh, business statistics are, are at some kind of disadvantage is a very, very practical one, is that it is possible that since uh, uh, frequent statistics have been used in science, in pretty much all of uh, empirical sciences for much longer than Bayesian statistics, which have become more popular only recently, um, it's possible that, uh, for example, your uh, um, research venue where you want to publish your results, so your your peers expect some kind of statistics done in a frequentist way using a frequentist uh, approach. And so, if, of course, if you if just there's a strict requirement uh, um, that uh, uh, you, you cannot use uh, something else, um, we hope this will change soon. In fact, uh, I will mention evidence that this is already changing, but uh, but it's something to, to be kept in mind, of course. Okay, so now these were the negatives, but uh, the rest of the of the talk is more uh, positive and. Uh, so let's, uh, I, I, I thought about 10 reasons, uh, just because it's a nice, nice uh, round number for uh, using basal analysis, 10 advantages. Um, the first one has to do with the so-called uh, replication crisis. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure uh, many of you have uh, uh, read about this. It's called uh, uh, replication or sometimes reproducibility crisis. So essentially it's something that has affected uh, uh, many empirical sciences and probably most prominently um, medicine and psychology, at least that's where this uh, kind of like uh, discussion started uh, most prominently, and I think it's still active to a large degree. Um, so um, replication crisis means that uh, uh, many of the empirical uh, analysis that were, uh, um, uh, that uh, marked the important results in these fields uh, were found later not to be reproducible, to, uh, to be essentially on very unstable grounds. And uh, if we look at the kind of uh, um, uh, what determine this kind of replication crisis, so it's not, of course, only about the statistics, but it's also about statistics. And we, in particular, we recognize uh, um, some uh, um, situations that, uh, to a, a certain extent, uh, may apply to empirical software engineering data analysis too. For example, um, a common problem was uh, low statistical power of the analysis, or the fact that, uh, well, this is a very, of course, uh, um, yeah, um, uh, in, in more like a negligence, but the fact that uh, uh, there was no sharing of raw data or, or the code for the analysis and so on. And so um, uh, this, this thing is, uh, is, uh, it triggered a lot of discussion. And uh, in fact, even in our own research community, there are uh, very, uh, very nice and important initiatives for improving the reproducibility. Um, but, uh, but this is certainly something that we have to, to think about. Um, so, um, how does this connect more precisely to Bayesian statistics or to statistics in general? So, um, um, not long ago in Nature, there was a survey, a survey of many scientists about uh, uh, rep this replication crisis. And so, uh, the scientists were asked to also uh, mention what uh, they thought the factors that were most frequently, um, most frequently uh, responsible or co-responsible for this replication crisis. And several of the factors that were reported had to do with statistics. So how we use the statistics and also how we, we teach uh, um, new scientists uh, to, to use statistics. And so it's clear that uh, at this point in time, uh, it's, uh, it's time to revisit the common statistical practices that have been uh, um, used for, for uh, nearly, nearly a century now in, uh, in, all, so in all empirical sciences. And uh, of course, these are not automatically imply that we should go Bayesian, but I hope that uh, I will show that uh, um, uh, there are uh, many uh, advantages with, with Bayesian statistics specifically. 
Um, so the second reason is uh, uh, has to do with uh, uh, what again other disciplines are doing, and the fact that they find more and more uh, practical value in Bayesian techniques. So um, what is happening? So I'm I'm using the words of uh, uh, Richard McElrath, who's the author of the uh, I think uh, the arguably the best uh, textbook that is out there about applied applied Bayesian statistics. And so he when he was talking about uh, how classical statistics are used uh, in, in science, in empirical sciences. He said that these classical statistical tools are not diverse enough uh, to handle many common research questions. And what he meant is that uh, uh, very often uh, non bayesian data analysis techniques are kind of like custom made and they were designed for a very specific application context. And then uh, if the context uh, of application changes even just a bit, it's quite possible that the techniques breaks down completely. So it doesn't really work as intended. And even worse, very often it, uh, it breaks down in a way that is hard to detect. So we think we're using it uh, in appropriate context, but actually we're not. And so what we get uh, as final result is not, uh, not really meaningful. Um, in contrast, Bayesian statistics are much more flexible and practically useful in many cases. Um, so to, to quote another uh, famous expert of uh, Bayesian statistics, Andrew Gelman. So he said that essentially Bayesian statistics are uh, very good at connecting data models and the research question that we have about, uh, about the data that we're analyzing in a clear way. And this is really a key for pretty much any science that is based on the analysis of empirical data. So this is uh, uh, the reason probably why more and more disciplines and uh, um, we, we are arguing of course that software engineering computer software engineering in particular should do the same are um, starting to use uh, starting to pick up uh, Bayesian uh, data analysis techniques. The third reason has to do with uh, the fact that Bayesian models are often easier to understand. So um, before I argue that uh, Bayesian models are easier, let me show you why what kind of evidence we have that uh, frequentist models are harder to interpret. So um, this, uh, this, is, uh, this uh, plot is a, is a summary of a uh, um, survey that was done uh, um, in 2002 um, with the um, students and the researchers and also um, uh, university teachers of uh, psychology. So uh, a branch of sciences that uh, use a lot of statistics for the empirical analysis of data. And they were asked essentially to uh, mark uh, which uh, of uh, six statements about the meaning of p-values, this uh, widely used uh, uh, concept in, in frequent statistics were true. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, more than 80% of all participants made at least one mistake. And uh, um, so the teacher of statistics did a little bit better, but not so much, not a, bit, a bit better than, than the students, but, but not really, uh, not a lot. So um, this is not because uh, these people are not uh, uh, well-educated or because they are negligent or because they, are, they didn't pay attention when they learned this concept. It's really largely because uh, these concepts are, uh, um, frequently statistics concepts, are uh, unintuitive and hard to, uh, to become familiar with and to, to um, report and use uh, correctly. So another piece of evidence here is uh, another survey um, also done with, uh, with the um, psychology um, students and uh, researchers and so on. Um, about a different concept, the concept of uh, um, confidence intervals. And here too, um, uh, a lot of people, most of them actually were uh, wrong. So they did, didn't really uh, interpret them correctly. Um, I should also say that uh, the mistakes that uh, these people did are not just uh, about minor irrelevant details, right? So they do really have practical consequences. And uh, um, another interesting thing, uh, and this brings us to why Bayesian statistics may be uh, more intuitive and better is that uh, very often, whenever um, somebody uh, misinterpreted a uh, frequentist concept, um, the mistake that they did was to interpret it with a Bayesian interpretation. For example, they interpreted a p value as a posterior probability. Well, uh, p value in frequentist statistics is not a posterior probability. And so this really indicates that Bayesian statistics are not just uh, more intuitive because. Uh, we are more familiar with them, so we think they're they are great, but because they really are closer to the kind of measures that we expect and that we can intuitively reason about rather than being some more formally correct, but uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, obscure mathematical concept. 
The fourth reason has, has to do with uh, avoiding dichotomous or uh, yes, no binary reasoning. Um, so uh, one of the most uh, consequential reactions to the replication crisis was a statement by the American Statistical Association um, in uh, um, uh, 2016 that uh, effectively called for a stop to um, framing scientific questions in terms of yes, no, or dichotomous alternatives. And this is typically the way in which uh, p-values, which again are a uh, widely used uh, uh, frequency statistic uh, uh, tool, are um, this is the way in which they're uh, most frequently used to, to frame our research question in a binary way and answer them as a binary way. Um, so um, a few years later, um, there was an even, uh, even uh, stronger position. So uh, the first one was, uh, okay, maybe we should not only use p-values, the, and then a few years later, it was like, uh, we should really stop using p-values altogether, right? So there's a growing consensus among uh, applied statisticians that uh, this is not uh, a productive and useful way to frame uh, scientific questions. And um, so um, we will see uh, in a few minutes that uh, Bayesian statistics uh, um, still offers the possibility of reasoning about uh, uh, in a binary way, but it also offers more uh, um, uh, rich and nuanced information. And so this is uh, kind of like lets us do a more um, sophisticated analysis that doesn't necessarily has to have to be framed in terms of dichotomous uh, analysis, dichotomous alternatives. So yes or no. The um, fifth reason uh, for uh, uh, the fifth advantage of using Bayesian statistics is that uh, uh, there are many uh, it, it, business st statistics come with many uh, techniques to uh, reduce the risk of overfitting. So um, overfitting is uh, uh, when our uh, fitted model essentially fits the data so closely that essentially it doesn't really generalize in any way. So it's pretty much useless for anything other than reporting the data that we have. Uh, used to, to train it. And uh, of course, Bayesian statistics is not immune to overfitting. Uh, that, that doesn't make any sense, but uh, it does offer uh, a variety of features that can be very effective at reducing the risk of overfitting. So here I mentioned three that are, I think, probably the most important. And we'll briefly see uh, some of them in uh, Richard's uh, uh, presentation, uh, practical presentation later. Um, so the first is uh, uh, one of the key ingredients of uh, uh, Bayesian statistics, the possibility of specifying priors. Because priors essentially can be used to um, express some kind of uh, a priori information. So a priori really means uh, before we uh, analyze the data that we are analyzing. And this typically is useful to reflect domain knowledge. So by combining the data with the priors, we don't only fit the model on the data. We also have a bit of information that compensates from the prior. Um, another technique that is widely used in Bayesian statistics is partial pooling. And so the idea here is that essentially um, we share information uh, as we fit a model on data between different partitions, between different clusters of the data, so that where the information is more abundant or accurate can be used to compensate for where the information is instead more scarce. And so where overfitting is more of a risk. So we don't throw away any data, but we just use uh, different partitions of the data to compensate each other's kind of like limitations if you want. Um, finally, we also have uh, a bunch of uh, techniques to measure, the, to compare different models and to measure in particular their predictive capabilities in terms of out of sample prediction. And so this is also another way that we reduce overfitting because we're not gonna always choose the most complex model just because it fits a better, but we also have this kind of other um, predict, uh, uh, predictability uh, measure, the relative, level, relative performance predictability. So uh, I should also say that these features, all these three features that I mentioned are in principle available also with known Bayesian statistics. However, um, it's fair to say that they're not normally used in that context. And instead in contrast, these features are pretty much built in Bayesian data analysis. So they are always there to help us. Reason number six has to do with uh, um, how we can represent quantitative distributional information. So the main output of a Bayesian data analysis is a posterior distribution of the model parameters. So this means that we don't just get uh, a single point estimate or maybe an interval, but we get a much more rich quantitative information that. Uh, uh, than what is normally available with uh, if we just had a point estimates, for example. 
Um, so here I just catch an example. Um, it's uh, kind of like a, a, a fairly, fairly hypothetical, but just to give you a, a little bit of a flavor of where this can be useful. Um, so uh, suppose that, for example, we are comparing different programming languages, maybe for performance, right? So we run uh, different implementations in different programming languages of the same uh, algorithms, for example, and we measure the running time. And we're comparing whether we want to wanna determine if a certain language H was faster than a certain language P. And um, so if we only have a, a point uh, um, statistics, like for example, the P value or uh, an effect size like the Cliff's Delta here is shown. So this, this gives us little information in particular in a situation like the one that is pictured here where both the P value and the effect size are not really, are, are not really strong indications. So the P value is not uh, usually considered significant, a P value of 33%. Uh, and uh, the effect size is also very, very small, very close to zero. So uh, of course, this does not change the, the nature of the data, but if you had a distributional information like, like here in this plot, then we could um, see a more nuanced picture of the comparison. In particular, we could see what kind of ranges of speed up uh, um, of one language over the other are more or less likely and how whether the distribution is skewed towards the language or the other and so on. We can still retrieve uh, uh, from the distribution the point estimates, but the opposite is not true instead. So it's always better to have more information and then use whatever we need for the task at hand. The um, seventh reason has to do with the flexibility of modeling that I kind of like hinted at already several points. So um, choosing the right statistical model is, uh, um, can be complicated. And I think it's particularly tricky in frequency statistics because uh, um, very often the different models that are offered and different analysis techniques and so on, they have, uh, they each, each of them requires uh, a very different analysis procedure. And often it's also based on very different assumptions. So um, it's very up, very, uh, tough to, to find our way and to be sure that we're picking the appropriate model to, for our analysis. So we are constrained in how much we can customize or extend our statistical model to suit our needs, since any change may make the analysis inapplicable or its results no longer valid. So this, is, uh, this also goes back to the uh, quote from McElrath that I mentioned before, that the classical statistical tools are, um, uh, are not diverse enough. They're not flexible. They're brittle. Uh, in contrast, uh, in Bayesian statistics, how we fit the model is largely independent of the details of how the model is built, what, what its features are, how, what characteristic it has. So um, in, a, in a nutshell, Bayesian fitting algorithms just uh, perform repeated application of Bayes theorem to derive a sample posterior distribution from a model that includes a likelihood and a prior and some data. So this means that uh, uh, we have more flexibility in customizing the model to our specific research questions and uh, also the, the analysis domain, for example. And after the model is built to our satisfaction, or we can also consider, of course, multiple models as we typically do, then we can proceed with feeding it on the data. But uh, uh, we don't have to worry about that uh, when we think about the model. Um, the eighth reason, um, advantage of using basic statistics is that uh, um, it's uh, easier to find fitting problems and test assumptions. So um, just in the previous point, I was talking about the flexibility of modeling. And so maybe uh, I gave the impression that uh, fitting a Bayesian model is always uh, very, very straightforward. So you just push a button and that's it. This is not the case, absolutely not. So things can go wrong for a variety of reasons. For example, the data could be too sparse or maybe the, the model is underspecified or maybe it's just too complex. So the, the analysis is, is, uh, doesn't perform well enough. But uh, uh, the, the silver lining of all this is that when we're trying to fit a Bayesian model and fitting fails, huh, it does not fail silently. So there are a bunch of analysis tools that Richard is going to show that are available and uh, they offer uh, very sophisticated diagnostics, which help a lot in spotting uh, fitting problems and uh, also debugging them. So figuring out how to, how to fix them, what kind of things we have to change uh, in our model or how we now we represent it to uh, avoid this problem. Uh, so here I am, I'm not uh, going to details here on this slide, I'm showing some of these uh, the, the visual, uh, for example, diagnostics that we can, that we can use, but uh, they will be covered in more detail in the next uh, section. 
The ninth reason um, is uh, about has to do with practical significance as opposed to pure as opposed to purely um, uh, statistical significance. So um, the, remember that uh, in Bayes analysis, we always have a quantitative distributional information in the form of a posterior distribution. And uh, that is uh, uh, very useful, not just because we can compute uh, uh, point estimates, as I said, but also because uh, um, it supports uh, uh, computing derived distribution by simulation of any quantities that maybe you're interested in our, for our analysis. For example, we can simulate the outcome in different scenarios. We can isolate the effects of a specific predictor or group of predictors. We can weigh different outcomes according to our utility in our domain. And uh, um, in, in all these cases, um, we always, uh, we don't just get the point estimates of our derived quantities, but we still get distribution. So they, they have, we have this rich information that also quantifies not just the estimated values, but also their uncertainties. And so the, all of these capabilities can support a really thorough analysis of uh, the kind of questions that typically come up in practical significance. Um, the last, uh, um, uh, the last uh, reason for uh, why using why we want to use uh, Bayesian data analysis is to plan and connect follow-up studies. So um, th th there was a, a famous sentence by Poincaré that said that science is built up of facts, as a house is built with stones, but a collection of of, uh, of facts is no more a science than a heap of stones is a house. So we could say perhaps something similar, replacing. Uh, Facts with the studies, right? So each individual contribution of, uh, of a piece of research, if you want. So um, of course, uh, whenever we, we write uh, a new study in a certain area, we try to relate its results to the previous studies about the same subject. Of course, we, we always try to do that. But uh, typically, the connection is done uh, in a mostly qualitative way and pretty much about high-level findings. So typically, we can say, oh, yeah, we are kind of like confirming some of the previous studies. We are going to the same direction, our results go in the same direction, or maybe you know, we, we contradict them, we, we dispute them. Uh, but, but this is a little bit of another form of dichotomous reason. So it would be um, more, uh, um, it would be better if uh, we could have more robust progress if we could uh, quantitatively connect the results of different studies and make uh, the result of one study conditional on one another in some way. So uh, based on that analysis, uh, um, naturally incorporates domain knowledge in the priors. And so by, we could, for example, tune the priors on the results of a previous study. And by comparing the analysis outcomes with different priors, we could uh, uh, effectively put the pieces of the puzzle together and build this kind of more organized uh, uh, collection of studies rather than just a heap. Okay, so these were the 10 key reasons for using based on that analysis. Uh, uh, beware of the replication crisis. Uh, the fact that more and more disciplines find practical value in Bayesian techniques. Uh, Bayesian models are typically easier to understand. They uh, avoid, they help us avoid the cotomous reasoning. They provide us with tools to minimize, to reduce at least the risk of overfitting. They provide quantitative distributional information instead of point estimates. They give us flexibility in modeling. They help us find fitting problems and when assumptions break down, they support practical significance and they can also be useful in follow-up studies. Um, so I'm going to stop here with my presentation. Um, so I've seen already some questions in the in the in the chat. Yes. Um, so Ashkan Sami asked. Uh, um, sorry. Let me read both. So prior distributions are very hard to. Find, right, that, that's the kind of objection, if I understand correctly. So yeah, so we will, we will see that, uh, uh, at least a glimpse of that uh, in, in practical, in the practical example that Richard will develop, but this is generally not actually true. So um, there are different, well, first of all, uh, um, there's always a, a last resort, right? So we can always uh, uh, stick with the uniform prior. In that case, essentially we don't, uh, really make any commitment. Using a unit per prior is usually not a good idea for a variety of reasons, um, both because it uh, kind of like maximizes overfitting. Remember that I said that uh, um, priors are one of the tools that we have to reduce the risk of overfitting, so to help generalization. So if we don't use them essentially, we kind of like say, okay, we only wanna listen to what the data says. And so that, uh, that increases the risk of overfitting. 
So, but we, we can always do that. Uh, more, more typically, one does neither pick uh, um, a prior that is very specific, nor one that is completely uniform. So there are a number of standard choices that are kind of like, uh, kind of like a standard well. And uh, so again, Richard is gonna use some of them. And, uh, uh, but another good thing is that, uh, um, so this thing of, about choosing the priors, so you shouldn't think about it as something like that, okay, I'm starting and I have to pick my priors and I have to pick them well because otherwise uh, uh, nothing in my eyes is gonna work. So choosing the prior, in fact, is a bit of a misnomer. You don't really choose them. You more like typically evaluate different priors, see what are the impact of them. And uh, um, there is also a technique uh, uh, called a prior predictive check that is exactly useful to evaluate the impact of a choice of a certain prior. So it's more about, uh, um, um, so choosing priors is more about formalizing our assumption that would be implicit anyway, in a more rigorous way. So I hope that uh, some of this uh, will, be, um, will be covered uh, more in detail later. So uh, then a uh, question from Prem, um, your experience, do people take advantage of the greater flexibility of Bayesian modeling or do they tend to mostly use very standard methods? I personally be afraid of making mistakes and tend to use common methods. That's a, that's a very, good, uh, very good point, absolutely. And um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. So um, the flexibility is kind of like a double-edged sword and uh, um, and in particular, it requires a lot of experience because otherwise you, you shoot yourself in the foot, right? So, um, so this is absolutely, um, absolutely true. And uh, I should also, um, so I think it's, it's uh, um, the way I, for example, approached uh, uh, when I started learning about Bayesian data analysis. And I think it's um, uh, like a um, process that most people can also follow is that, of course, I didn't jump right into the full flexibility. You typically start uh, with simple models, models that you already know that are also used uh, in slightly different ways in frequency statistics. Typically, for example, linear regressive models. That's something that uh, um, if you have some knowledge of statistics, you're typically familiar with. And so you just, you just use them with Bayesian uh, statistics. They're not going to make a gigantic difference, but they let you kind of like become familiar with uh, the various uh, um, uh, features and kinks of, of, Bayesian, of Bayesian statistics. And then you can uh, step it up from there. So you can gradually maybe, once you become familiar, you can learn, uh, for example, a, a new um, uh, level of, uh, of parameters in your model and uh, you go to multi-level and so on. The nice thing though, is that uh, um, as I was referring, uh, mentioning before, so in, in frequency statistics, if you change to a different kind of analysis, you might have to use a different framework, a different algorithm, a different library. That doesn't happen normally in Bayesian statistics. So um, once you know how to do uh, linear regression, um, it's not a big step. You're still gonna use the same diagnostic. You're still gonna use the same uh, input syntax for multi-level models, for example, or for more complex analysis. So it's kind of like, uh, of course, uh, it, it does require effort. That's absolutely true, but, uh, but at least it, the effort can be incremental. So it seems that they're question in the Q&A window. Let me get it. Uh, uh, yeah, do you mind uh, getting it? It doesn't seem like, I think I have to stop sharing. Well, I can do that, probably, but. Well, I mean, but or me and Richard can can do this one in the Q&A. Yes, want. yes. Okay, so so uh, Hakan uh, asks us uh, why do we have to use p-values in a binary way? That is um, kind of a general uh, counter argument that is valid. That of course we, in theory, we can come up with new statistical tests and new ways of using frequency statistics that avoid some of the problems to, with, with some of the current tools. Um, but you have to also view a, um, a statistical test. It also comes with sort of sociological <laughs> ways of using them and expectations on how we use them. So in some sense, we are stuck because even if you would start um, using uh, an existing test in a different way, it's very likely that a reader or a reviewer even will still assume when they see a p-value uh, that, that, and make sort of a dichotomous interpretation of it. So, so I do think that not only are there other analytical tools available in BDA, in Bayesian statistics, 
we also have a chance to get rid of some of the sociological and interpretative uh, um, kind of traditions that have evolved al alongside frequentist statistics. So I think, uh, yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, now Carlo, hypothesis can... testing, yes. Carlo, yeah. can you repeat Prem's question, please? Uh, uh, yes, I, I thought I did actually, but maybe I was, uh, I was slightly summarizing it, but... Uh... So um, his question was, uh, he said that he appreciates my comment about uh, the greater flexibility of Bayesian modeling. Um, your experience, do people take advantage of this practice or do they tend to mostly use uh, very standard methods? I personally be afraid of making a mistake and tend to use common methods. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, if we can just add there that you definitely see this. If Even if you look at Richard McElrath's scientific papers, uh, you can see a progression there. And in the last year or two, he's using much more complex uh, ways of using Bayesian uh, uh, analysis techniques uh, with new ways of models that are motivated by his scientific uh, situation and question. And I, I can definitely see this happening also in software engineering. Most likely people will use Bayesian uh, data analysis in more traditional ways, in more classical models at, to, at the start, but in a few years, it's more likely we can adapt and use uh, models that fit to our situation and, and this is very hard to do in frequent statistics because then you need to find a statistician who have developed a test that suits, suits your situation. Basically some of the later studies that Carlo, me and Robert have been working on together with other co-authors have not been possible if we would not have used patient data analysis. And, and that is a fact. We, we, we couldn't fall back to frequentist statistics in those cases because frequentist statistics doesn't give us a posterior probability distribution. But, but I it think is, it's also. Yeah, but it is true that you could, in theory, of course, uh, develop a specific statistical frequentist test for that specific situation. So there's no, I don't think there's a, a theoretical limit there, then, but it's just that. Of course, the current frequency statistics is a certain toolbox set of methods and, and they come with ways of using and interpreting them. And the thing is that with the approach that we're proposing, you will have one toolbox that you will use no matter what type of tests and so on that you want to do. Instead of learning MANOVA, ANOVA, ANCOVA, whatever, you will have one principled way of modeling this. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, did you answer Hakan's uh, question, the, the NHST question? So Yeah, it was a, uh, a, a follow-up. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we did. Uh, <laughs> I hope, Hakan. Um, You're welcome to, to ask again if yeah. that's not the case. Should we move on, um, maybe, Richard? Or Yes, I think it's a good time. So yeah, I will okay. give you the floor, Richard. So uh, we can continue doing as now, uh, perhaps sometimes uh, every now and then I'll stop by and, and check if there are any questions and so on in the chat window. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, let's, uh, let's try uh, to, uh, to, uh, to save the questions after each session. So my part is divided into two parts. First, I have a short presentation. And then after that presentation, I will do some li live coding. That's the idea at least. Uh, the GitHub repository that I will give you a link to and so on contains all the code and you can start playing around yourself. But of course there's in particular one book that you need and there's only one book that you need to get started. And that is statistical rethinking in particular, the second edition. And I would urge you to buy the second edition for many reasons. Uh, the main reason being that Richard McElrath in that book actually added um, uh, causality uh, analysis which didn't, uh, which was not included in the first edition. So we're gonna talk about how to do patient data analysis here. And if you remember Carlos' part here, he talked, he talked about priors, he talked about likelihoods and so on. And uh, the fact is that when we use our data and then use our priors and use our likelihood, we can calculate a posterior. That's basically the only thing we need to know at this stage. And priors, as Carlo already said, is prior knowledge. But it's not necessarily prior knowledge. It can also be seen as a way to delimit the search space for the sampler. That is to say, 
there is always some prior knowledge. And so far, after having done very many studies these years, I have not found one case where there is no prior knowledge. So uniform priors are really not an option for me because I am very, very afraid of overfitting, learning too much about data. Another prior, you could see it as a prior, is the likelihood that we need to decide on. And that is the assumptions we have about the underlying data generation process. That is to say, how, how was the empirical data generated? And then we have lots of distributions we can choose between, right? We have the normal Gaussian, we have Poisson, we have negative binomial and so on and so forth. But the important part here is that when we pick a likelihood, then we should always fall back on epistemological and ontological reasons for that likelihood. And I'll come back to what that means. Uh, the point is at least that when we have data and we have prior and we have likelihood, when we mul multiply these two, that leads to posterior distribution and the posterior can be joint. That is to say, we can estimate more than one parameter well, some of the later studies that I've been working on have estimated over a thousand parameters in large multi-level models. So I, I haven't really seen any theoretical limits yet that, that, that I have faced as an empirical researcher in software engineering. But as Carla pointed out, there are some points that we need to be careful about, especially if we want to use more advanced concepts like Gaussian processes in uh, multi-level models where we have much data. Uh, so far, I've been staying away from that. So uh, I'm going to show you step by step how to design a simple model. So you can do these model specifications in basically any language you want. You can use Python uh, and you can use Stan in Python. And Stan is uh, the software package we often use. If we don't use it directly, then we use it indirectly via some other package. And here you have three uh, different packages that all uh, that two of them use Stan as an underlying engine, while one does not. So if you look at the left, you see the Turing library, uh, and this is Julia, the Julia programming language, which I have started to use more and more lately. Uh, the Turing library gives you ample of possibility to declare multi-level models and whatnot. Very large library. I recommend you to look into that. Uh, in the bottom, you see a library called BRMS, which uses uh, something that many of you might have heard about called LME4 syntax. That is to say a syntax which is very short and to the point when you declare models. Uh, some of you might be used to that already. Uh, the problem, uh, the problem that the thing that you have to be careful about with BRMS is that it uses a lot of default priors and so on. It also warns you about it, but never use default priors. You should always check your priors before sampling. And then in the top right corner, you see another specification, which is the rethinking package. And that package actually belongs to the book. And the book that I talked about in the beginning it has lots and lots and lots of examples. And they use the rethinking package. All these three specifications you see in the black boxes they are basically specifying the mathematical model that we see here in the middle. And what we're saying here is that we have an outcome Y that we assume to be normally distributed, and we want to estimate two parameters. So parameters is something that we want to estimate, and they, they are often connected to a predictor that we use to estimate the outcome, which in this case is Y. And then we have, uh, of course, uh, a linear model in this case, we have a grand intercept alpha, and we want to estimate the beta sub L parameter, which is uh, a parameter connected to a predictor, X in this case, a data point. And we use that to predict mu, right? And then we set priors. We have three priors here. We have a prior for alpha, we have a prior for beta, and we have a pr prior on the sigma, which is an exponential. It's not really important what type of price was set here. This is just to show you that you can use mathematical notation, and then easily translate this into code, basically. So that gives you a lot of, uh, um, um, and Charles Weir has a very good question. Are the equivalent libraries available in Python? Yes, in particular PyStan. So you can write and work in Stan, which is the 
language that most of these uh, packages use. And if you use PyStan, you will be able to use the old, all the functionality that Stan has to offer. So uh, please try to, please use uh, PyStan if you can. Uh, and there's lots and lots of help you can get in the community, in the Stan community. So what is the step, uh, what is the first step that we should do? Well, the first step that we should do is set a prior on our outcome because that is what a likelihood is. That is just another prior. Our assumptions about the underlying data generative model um, that we are assuming here for, for uh, when we build our models, right? So how do we pick one? We should basically fall back on two reasons for picking one, epistemological reasons and ontological. So the epistemological reasons is all about maximum entropy from information theory. So we want to pick a distribution that can happen in most ways, given our data, because that distribution also has the biggest information entropy. And of course, then you also have ontological reasons, and that is connected to the occurrence of patterns in nature. For example, we know that normal Gaussian distributions are very common in nature. When we sum up very many small changes, they get normally distributed. So these are the type of arguments you have when you argue for your likelihood in your model, what we assume about the data, the underlying data gener generation model. And in the end, strict falsification, as we are used to in, from coming from frequentist background, is really not possible when we deal with these uh, things, because we don't have a binary yes and no right wrong answer here. Uh, these type of hypotheses that we are used to, they are not models, right? And in the end, what matters really are measurements, measurement errors and measurements that we collect the correct data, that it's qualitative, uh, quality and not quantity that we're talking about. So this is about the likelihood. We need to fall back on that. And I'll give you an example later. The next thing that we should look into are the priors. And this is, this is usually, and this was for me also a black box and I was a, a bit, uh, you know, I saw it a bit as magic. So generally speaking, we want to avoid priors that have minus infinity to plus infinity as a range, because this leads to overfitting. This is basically what frequentist techniques use and they overfit a maximum. I would say that prior knowledge always exists in some form. You would think not, but it does. There's always some prior knowledge. There's always some theoretical maximum or a minimum and so on. And that's what it's all about. The, the purpose, another purpose for why we would like to have priors that are not infinity uh, is to delimit the space that the sampler must explore. Otherwise, it will be too large for the sampler. So that is another thing. It, it's about efficiency for the sampler. And then, of course, there are logical principles for assigning priors. We, we have prior elicitation, and we have all these things that we can use to extract prior knowledge from experts if we need to. And that is not always the case. That is to say that we need to. But there, such things exist. So when we have these priors and we start fiddling with these priors, and we remember now, we haven't even looked at the empirical data. This is something we can do before we even go out to fetch the empirical data. We do something called prior predictive checks. So we build a, we build a first model and we set priors on it. And then we generate data only from these priors using no empirical data and use graphical checks to see are they same. So we are doing something called sensitivity analyses. So to the right here, you see two types of priors. So this is a linear model. It has an alpha and a beta parameter. That is to say a general overall mean and a beta parameter connected to uh, uh, one predictor. On the top corner, you see what happens when we use, I would say default priors in this case. It's very common to set a broad default normal prior on alpha and a zero one normal prior on beta parameters. What you see here is basically the priors exploding in the space. 
the maximum and minimum theoretical values that we have defined for this problem is zero and uh, is hundred and zero, right? So any any lines that stick outside those dashed lines is basically a prior overfitting, you could say. It's a prior that is quite useless for our purposes. But if we then set priors that are much more distinct, delimiting, uh, we can still allow for absurd values. You still see some lines in the bottom plot where that are outside the dashed lines, but, but they are not as many. And we have a focus on the priors in the bottom part, uh, in, in, the, in the part between the dashed lines, basically. So these are the type of prior predictive checks you do. And there are very many good libraries that helps you with this. So these plots I did completely by myself using the plots, uh, plot func functionality in R, R base. But there is a library called base plot, which I refer to at the end of this uh, presentation, which you can use that have all these plots readily made and you can just shove in the priors basically. So we've talked about the likelihood. And now we've talked about the priors. So what's next? Well, we need to calculate the posterior. As uh, Carlo showed, we need to somehow uh, use an engine, which is basis theorem in this case, to get a posterior, right? And very many people then automatically think that we need to use Markov chain Monte Carlo. And I have to say, I do it 99 times out of 100, but there are other options also. So we don't have to necessarily think about Markov chain Monte Carlo only. You have grid approximations for simpler problems. Same with quadratic approximation. If you have a likelihood that is normally distribute, uh, distributed, you have SIR, you have approximate Bayesian computations if you don't want to set a likelihood on your model. But in the end, it is very common that you use Markov chain Monte Carlo in the natural sciences, whether it's physics or something else. And we have early versions of this, Metropolis Hastings, which Ariana Rosenbluth and other people worked on. And of course, we have Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which Stanislav Ulam and other people worked on. Now, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is the sampler that we use when we use STAN as a default. But as I said, it's important to remember, we don't need to use Monte Carlo sampling because it, sometimes it can take a lot of time. There are other things that you can use if you need. I, on the other hand, have to say that uh, it, it, it has, I've yet to come to an example where I cannot use Monte Carlo sampling. So once we uh, have sampled, as Carlo mentioned, there are lots of diagnostics here. There are in particular three plus one that you really want to have an eye on. And the first one being R hat. And R hat basically should converge toward, towards one. And this is a measurement of how well the chains that we use in Monte Carlo sampling have converged independently towards one posterior. How certain are we that we have found a true posterior in a sense? And then we have effective sample sizes, which is an indication for each parameter, how many samples we have. This tells us how certain we can be about the estimates in the end. If we have 50 samples for a parameter, not good. If it's up in the thousands, well, we can estimate fairly surely the, the tails of that distribution. And then we have lots of visual, as you see, uh, plots that we plot uh, the diagnostics here. And I would recommend you to always visualize these type of things because it's easier to note problems. We also have trace plots, as we've seen, which uh, Carl also showed previously. And of course, I, I might add, we have something that we always look into and that's called divergences. When we have a chain, a, a one part of the sampler going astray somehow, then we have a problem. If we have one divergence, we should be careful. But the point here is that the sampler will never be quiet. It will tell you immediately that something is a problem. And then you will learn how to deal with that problem. So we have a likelihood, we have a prior, we've also 
set these price and worked on that. We have declared our models and so on, and we have sampled this, right? So what we do then after this, once we have sampled the model, is something called posterior predictive checks. And this we do to see how well does our data, the empirical data we have, match our model's predictions. And that's basically what we do. It's just a comparison here. How well do we fit? And the same applies here. We visualize a lot, but you can fall back on point estimates like uh, basis R square and so on, if you're more comfortable with that. So now we have gone through all these steps, all of them, and that's super good. Now we might be able to trust what we've reached. If you work with many models, you might have a model comparison step here. In this case, we fall back on something called Lou. I would show that very briefly in the example also. But the fact is that very often we have many models that we compare uh, before we select one master model. The final step we have, once we've selected a primary model, one model to rule them all in a sense, is to compute stuff. That is to say, now we have a posterior probability distribution. And it's really up to our imagination what we want to compute. Of course, we can pick point estimates and so on, like Robert said, uh, but we can also plot the complete posterior probability distributions. And more importantly, as Carlo showed, we can also simulate a lot of things. So at the end of this slide here, you see some papers or books that are very good. Uh, in this case, I would start with the first uh, reference. And that's the only one you need. And after that, you'll be on your own and you will start picking this apart yourself. And also you have some links to software and so on. So before I continue now with the little live coding thing here, I'm just going to check with Robert and Carla how we are on time. I guess we're OK. We're a little bit late, but uh, I sorry. Yeah, I know. was uh, writing it in the in the chat. Uh, um, so you're you're about four minutes over time. So it's, okay, it's not so let's speed up. <laughs> so uh, this is an example that you have on GitHub. So you can do this in uh, quiet and in in peace uh, back home later if you want to. You have a link to the GitHub repository here also if you want to. So uh, what I do here, I use the uh, rethinking library. Uh, as a model specification. I do this in R, but you can do that in whatever language you want. I load a library to be able to load the file that I have downloaded from the Promise website, which Sayad and Mensi set up once. And this data set was contributed by Martin Shepard from Brunel. So uh, I remove some columns from that data set and I remove factors from one of the variables and just use numbers instead. And in the end, we have one data frame. And what we have here is an outcome effort, which is the number of hours a project was needed, uh, a project needed in order to reach its goals. And the language is simply an indicator which programming language the project used. And that's it. So, we know our outcome is effort. So it's a count from zero and upwards, which means that we should use a Poisson distribution. Now, a Poisson distribution, which is about counts, uh, there are no negative numbers, uh, has some assumptions. And one of the assumptions is that the variance and the mean should be approximately equal. So from an epistemological perspective, we should use a Poisson. However, as we see here, the variance in the mean is very much different. So this indicates that we need to fall back on another very common distribution. Uh, that is the maximum entropy distribution in this case, which is a negative binomial or a gamma Poisson that it's also called, which models the variance separately. But it's a, basically a Poisson but it models the variance separately. So let's, uh, uh, let's see here now. Let's, set, let's build a null model, which is very common.
So what I simply do, I use a function called ulam. I put a list in that and I say that effort is distributed approximately as a gamma Poisson. That's what I'm saying. And we want to estimate two parameters, lambda, which is the count, and uh, let's call it phi, which is the variance. And then since it's a generalized linear model, I put a log link there. And I just say that I want to estimate an alpha, a general grand mean. And then I want to set a prior on that. And I want to set a prior on phi. Now phi is very easy. It should be a real number and it should be positive, which basically leaves us with an exponential. But what should alpha be? And for that, we can use a prior predicted check, basically. We can uh, sample from a log normal. And then we say that we want to sample from our log normal. Let's see now, we can do like this and see what values we get. Now, what do we know about our data set? Basically nothing. We know that it's effort, time spent on a project. So is it really possible that we spend this much, hour, these many hours on a project? 2.8 times 10 to the power of 19. Probably not. We would have to have a project working until the universe explodes. So we need to find some other priors. Well, uh, is it impossible that we might have 11 million hours in a project? I mean, now we've delimited it quite heavily, but it's still quite large numbers. And remember now, we're, we're randomly sampling here, right? But it's still very large numbers. So uh, a normal 0, 04 might be the prior that is suitable for alpha. And the reason I have sampled from a log norm is because we have a, a log link, of course. So now we put the uh, prior there and then we give it the data. I have four cores on my computer. I want to run four chains. I run a backend called command stan. And uh, I run, let's say 5,000 iterations. And I forgot a comma here. So what happens now basically is that the rethinking package translates this into stan code, which then is um, compiled into binary. So basically C++, uh, and that binary is then used to sample the model. And you see, you get some warnings in the beginning, but those are okay. And, and they, they, they warn you in case something might be wrong. So um, now, we have, uh, now we've sampled our first model. We have estimated a grand mean. That's what we've done. Nothing more, nothing less. And we can look at some diagnostics. R hat, effective sample size, on the right hand side, they're up in thousands. That's good. R hat is one. That's good. Anything below 1.01 .01 is good. And we see that the mean is 8.53. But of course, that was a log. So to find out what the mean is on the outcome scale, we need to exponentiate. So 5,000 hours seems to be the grand overall mean of the data set. Now I can extend this model. And you see that in the example that I have, how you can extend it more and more and have varying intercepts and so on. I can do, a, which is really not necessarily here with a null model since it's so simple, but I can do a post check. In this case, it's just one grand mean. I can compare this model with other models using a compare. And then I simply give it the different models and tell it to use Lou to compare the model. And you will find the one example also in the, in, the, in the GitHub repository. And of course, we can compute a lot of stuff now. We can uh, plot posterior values with uncertainty. In our particular case, it's really not uh, that uh, sexy because we simply have estimated the phi and alpha and that's it. But we have the 89% uncertainty and estimated mean. So you could say that these are kind of point estimates. And then we can extract and work on the samples themselves. So uh, we can uh, extract directly from the posterior probability distribution. And we can look what it contains. 
and it contains lots and lots and lots of samples. So we have 10,000 samples of alpha and 10,000 samples of phi. And then we can start comparing stuff. So all these things we could do with a posterior probability distribution. So for those who are interested, you can always go to the GitHub repository and you can make sure to download or clone this repository. And there you have a readme where you can look into this and you also have the tutorial online where you can go step by step and see what we're doing. So I guess I was able to cut it a bit short now. So Robert, uh, Carlo, anything to add? Yeah, I guess, uh, of course, this, this, this gives you a flavor of the steps involved and the type of environments you can work with. Of course, you will not <laughs> be able to follow uh, because Richard is, is like an expert in this, of course. But, but um, I think the one important thing to take from this, and you, you can, of course, follow along in the example later with the code and links here, uh, is that basically this workflow and the framework and what you do will be the same and this is one of the big <laughs> advantages you, you will learn one sort of logically connected uh, set of steps and workflow and then what you will learn over time is to create a model and set priors uh, uh, that fits your your problem and your situation and then the strength in that is that uh, it's actually a few simple libraries and it's, it's the same tools you can use to analyze the posterior and so on. So I think to, what, what you can take from this uh, is uh, that yes, this is different. And in some sense, of course, there is a, a larger first step that you need to hurdle compared to just downloading an existing R package and applying and calling a function. This is quite different, but you get a lot of uh, power and flexibility from that. Uh, and, and that uh, is going to be beneficial to our whole community over time. Yes. Oh, Hawken is leaving. So you'll miss my great part. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Carlo, uh, you want to add something there? No, no, I don't think so. I think you gave a very good summary. Um, and I think now we we can have some time for if there are more questions. And otherwise, I was seeing that Richard was uh, already sketching another model just to give you a little. So if um, if there are no immediate questions, maybe you can take a few more minutes to do that, Richard. Yeah, let me see here. I can, uh, let's see now. Let's see if we don't have. So uh, pointing to what Robert said, what, what you can do quite easily now is uh, extend this model. Uh, first of all, the data set as is contains quite a lot of different variables. Uh, and that's why it's a good example. As you see here, I, I removed lots of different predictors, potential predictors. We only used effort as an outcome that we want to estimate. And then I use languages or language as, a, uh, uh, as a, one of the predictors. Uh, so we can easily add that predictor or any other predictor also for that matter to more models, right? And we can see the effect adding predictors have on these models. So we could, for example, add a varying intercept, which is basically, we want to estimate the mean for each and every language. That is what we've done in this case. So what it, what it does now is it goes through the same approach, right? It uh, translates to Stan, Stan compiles it to a binary, and then we sample the model. And once we have this, we can go through the exact same approach that we did before. Data includes, uh, yeah, of course, because I removed everything now, right? Uh, voila. 
the the good thing well now actually it's a good point here and um, it's it's quite a lot easier to deal with missing values in Yushin Bayesian data analysis and particularly if it's missing in the outcome because it's simply a, a new estimation that you do that's the only thing that's the difference so it's very much easier and as in the previous example we also got some warnings but what we can do now we can we can once again look at the posterior distribution and now you're going to see something that I think it's super nice compared to you with using Cohen's alpha, Cohen's delta and all that. Uh, so we have a posterior distribution here now, but it has more parameters because we've added the languages, right? So we have three languages and then we have also the phi, the dispersion, the variance that we want to measure. So we can, first of all, we can look at, we can actually look at, at the, The plots here. So this is basically the estimations we have. You can see that one language, language three, has much lower values, which means that it takes less effort to use that language. And that's very nice. Uh, of course, we should all use that language and then all our projects will succeed and not use as much effort. But there are two other languages, and we would like to compare them. We see that language two is slightly better. And the good thing with comparing using a posterior is that it's basically just about using simple arithmetic. So we can compare language two with language one. And then you have a comparison there. And let's look at the difference, a distribution of the differences. So this is, this is an effect size, but it's not a simple point estimate. We have a distribution of effect sizes here. And that is something super nice. We can also, of course, we can actually make it even simpler. We can actually do like this and say that out of 10,000 times, language number two will be better 7,529 times. And these are the type of question you can pose to a posterior, but be careful because it will, it will always give you an answer, but it not, might not make sense. So you have to be careful about how you, how you ask the question. And then Ashkan asked me, how, how did I model the likelihood for multiple variables? Uh, so, it, yeah, exactly. So it's a multivariable, uh, multivariable model I basically have here. Um, so, and then I didn't see the question, but maybe uh, Carlo is answering that question now. No, sorry, I, I thought you were just um, um, picking it up uh, live and I just moved it to the answer one. But so, ah. uh, to repeat the question is, could you please go over how you model likelihood for multiple variable values? I mean, the models that are multivariable. So yeah, so so uh, multivariable or, or multivariate, that, that's the thing. I, so you could say that immediately when you add predictors here, if I add another predictor here, Let's call it uh, beta L times uh, times some predictor that we have, some data we have. Uh, now it's a multi-variable model, right? We have more than one variable. Now, a multivariate model, on the other hand, is concerning the outcome when we have more than one outcomes. Uh, that we want to separate. Let, let's put it this way. If you have done a survey and you have uh, five Likert scale questions, you might want to model, the, model them as a multivariate. And then you, of course, have to fall back on what type of likelihoods these Likert scale questions need. And the type of likelihood they need is very often a cumulative, adjacent category, uh, sequential type of likelihoods. And once you've done your LU, your comparison that you do down here, you will also see which type of likelihoods gives you an edge when it comes to out of sample prediction. So here I've used LU on the two models that we have uh, declared. And as you can see, according to the compare function, it puts all the weight on the M1 model, the one that is a bit more complex. Uh, I, I can add, Ashken, that I mean we don't really have time because this is this is the part of Bayesian an analysis where you really have that flexibility. So you know, how, cre creating that model and writing uh, the, the form of that likelihood 
that is the main task that you will have left when you have learned to use these tools here. Um, so, I mean, the way I have approached that is often to start from the very simple models and then you will build up and you will go to a linear model with multiple uh, variables. And, you know, later you will have maybe multivariate. So there are multiple outputs and so on. So it's not um, as strange in a sense. It's almost like learning to use some existing linear models or, or an existing R package. And what you will learn over time is a certain language and like building blocks so that you can put together a model that fits your data and your situation, I guess. So, but you know, we don't have the time. We, we, we cannot teach that. that. That will be a course probably to, to learn all the ups and downs of that. But Ashkan, uh, if you have any questions, please, please come back to me because the question you have in the Q&A now, it's very easy to do uh, because you, you look at the correlation and you model the correlation with a correlation prior to make sure that you look at the correlation between the predictors that you want to model. And at very many times, it gives you much better out of sample predictions. So it, it really jumps in the prediction power, the model. Should I maybe start my part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't have that much time left. Maybe. My God, it flies. <laughs> yes. No, I think we're doing pretty fine with time, but, uh, but you can definitely start, um, uh, Robert, and then uh, we okay. can take all the time that is left for, for final questions and comments. So let me see. Do you see my slide now? Yeah, but I see the presentation mode. Oh, you do? Okay. That's uh, annoying. What if I do like this? Then I see the... the now I see the presentation mode. <laughs> wow. Okay, so I'll stop sharing then. So maybe I do like this. That's simpler. Now. Now, it, now it works. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit, I'll try to connect this uh, uh, back a little bit high level and connect it to software engineering. So how do we actually use this and what, what will it mean to use this in, in uh, software engineering? And uh, now can I not go forward? Okay. So the big picture here of using BDA in software engineering. So Catalog in part one give a, gave a great motivation, man, many reasons for why this is an interesting set of techniques. And, uh, and then Richard has, has shown you some of the flavor of uh, the different steps involved. Um, but what do we need more? And we think that there is a big push now in, in BDA, in the statistics community, to developing specific guidelines and workflows. So how will you actually use this now newfound power and flexibility and these different tools? And um, we think that we also will need to maybe adapt this and you know maybe even simplify it a little bit for software engineering data. But of course, we can fall back to these new workflows and guidelines that are being developed in, in statistics. Uh, I also want to mention uh, maybe two key points on what, how are we going to use this output, these posteriors that we get uh, in software engineering. And uh, those connect to the, I think the two final reasons that Carlo gave in part one. There's, there is a scientific reason. Uh, so I will simplify it a little bit and give you only two reasons here, how we can use the output. And um, um, so we, we can more easily build chains of evidence. So basically connecting and building on one study in the next one. We think that will be uh, easier here because it's, it's part of the uh, mentality and philosophy and the, uh, the, the processes, the way you use PDA is that you think about your priors and when doing so, then we can take in information from, uh, from other studies. So in some sense, you can think of this as a little bit that my posterior, what I get out from, uh, I have to check the chat here. Is there something for me? 
not now. Um, so the posterior I get from my study can be used as input and help set the prior in another study and vice versa. So I can also use a previous Bayesian analysis in software engineering to inform my prior in my study. So we can build these chains of evidence much more clearly and with more precision rather than today, each study in software engineering maybe will use a statistical uh, test but often then the transfer to the next study is, is quite vague. And we, we, we just use maybe these dichotomous answers that we get from frequency statistics and the use of p-values. Um, so another way, an important way that also Carlo mentioned is that it's more of a, for practitioners in software engineering, it's, it's more of an engineering game here is that we can actually do simulation of different scenarios that can help guide our practitioners. So, and then based on that, we can discuss what are the implications for real world software engineering teams or whatever kind of software engineering question we, we want uh, help answering. Uh, so in some sense, uh, there is a, an important context here. So we are going to set priors and we have, we'll have a workflow that helps us in this we will get out posteriors. And a very important thing we can do with them is to do simulations and consider the practical effect, uh, practical significance on, uh, on practitioners. So this is like a current view of one BDA workflow, but it's you see it's super complex, right? And um, but this is being developed now and refined and they write books about this in, in uh, statistics and Gelman is, is one of the key uh, researchers here and he's, uh, they are writing this book which is available, the current version on archive, Bayesian workflow. So there, this is good to have in the background but you don't need to start there. So you can start with something more simple. And we have tried to condense kind of a, a simpler software engineering version of this. Uh, and this is also available on archive and it's currently in submission uh, on applying these Bayesian analysis guidelines or workflows to empirical software engineering data. So I will show you a little bit more uh, what, what uh, this condensed version can look like. And a key feature here is incremental modeling. So we are not going to build only one model we are typically going to build several models so that we can compare and see what are their different strengths and uh, does uh, is there e even a reason to use a more complex uh, model for my data? Uh, so we build the model in steps. And one reason for this is that it's quite unlikely that we can uh, select the right model right from the start. So, in, you know, we, we will need to have a more agile and continuous process when doing this. So this allows us to explore and refine our model, so simplify our model based on the strengths uh, we see uh, while using it. And in software engineering, we're quite used to this type of, uh, of uh, ways of working. So it's almost like an iterative agile process where we, we use the latest iteration to refine and, and try something new in the next uh, uh, in the next sprint, so to speak. And there are two main ways to, to get like a first model that you can start evolving from. And probably the, 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 a, a good way is to start with the simplest thinkable model. So what, what Richard did in part two was actually to say, we are going to model the project effort in a software engineering project. So the number of hours that, that will be used in this project, simply by saying that we have an average value. So let's estimate there is, this is the probably the simplest model we can think of in this situation. So there's only going to be a distribution of a single thing, which is the estimated project uh, a number of hours, right? So this is, this is definitely the start, this type of starting point. So you start with the simplest possible, and then you see uh, what does this give me? So you kind of establish a baseline that you can then compare to. So maybe in the next step, you will go from using a single average project effort to having a single 
average effort per language in this case was a second model you can consider in that case. And then you can go on and add more and more factors that you have in your empirical data, and you can study the effect uh, um, of using these models. So this is one way. The other way is to start with some existing uh, knowledge about like a good model can be from fr traditional frequency statistics. Uh, so if you, then you might not start from such a simple model, you might start with a very simple linear model maybe based on what is known in the software engineering literature about how do we predict project effort when we have a certain set of project characteristics, for example, maybe number of people involved or whatever it can be, number of requirements, whatever, right? And then if you start here, then you might need in your iterations or increments to both simplify or make the model stronger and more complex in some sense. So here is one sort of software engineering BDA workflow, which is fairly simple. Uh, and it's based on like for every increment, for every model that we do create, there are three steps that we go through and they are checking the plausibility of our prior together with our model, the workability of our model. So can we compute with it? Can we use it for inference for calculating the parameters? And then the third step is adequacy. So when we actually connect the model and the prior with our empirical data, can uh, the, the posterior we get uh, capture uh, the, the data that we uh, have, have seen there? So these are like three steps that we go through for every model. So in for model one, we will go through these three steps. And then we, uh, based on the result here, maybe we do some simple analysis of model one, and then we maybe improve our model and try model two. We go through the th same three steps. And now when we have two models, we can compare them and see how do they compare to each other? Was there any gain in the change we made from model one to model two? And then in the end, we will select the one model that has good characteristics for our use case. And then we can analyze what does this tell us about our research questions, for example. And so the first step when we uh, evaluate a model and its prior is to check, is, uh, the, is it consistent with our existing domain knowledge? So this is clearly strongly connected to the questions we had before on how do you select priors? So we are going to run our priors through our model. We are not yet using our empirical data. And we are going to look at uh, what are the um, implications of those prior when we run them through our model. So we do something that Richard mentioned called prior predictive simulations, which is basically looking at these implications. So if we look at something like a distribution of project effort, then what do we, uh, how, how can we limit which priors are, are, are more or less useful for this? Well, there are some general rules we can use. So first we can look at physical limits. So one physical limit is that we cannot have a negative project length, right? So it's not possible to run a software engineering project which has below and takes less than zero hours, right? So this is a fairly obvious one, uh, but there can also be logical limits. Uh, for example, here, it could be that, you know, we cannot have a project which is more than 100,000 years maybe, because we assume there's gonna be some software developers in it and homo sapiens, they will probably be homo sapiens. <laughs> And uh, then, so 100K is definitely too long, right? So we can get very rough restrictions rather than having a uniform prior, which could basically not uh, even look at such limits. Then of course we have common sense. So we can say that very short projects say on the order of hours are maybe not uh, realistic or interesting. It's not the type of setting that we are interested in or very long projects say on the order of several decades or centuries. This, of course, can depend on your context and what type of specific research question you're investigating or the project you're investigating, but, but there will be some kind of very generic common sense that you can use. And then, of course, we can go to the literature. So this allows us to connect to the existing literature 
So we can say that, okay, maybe we know from a lot of textbooks and, and previous empirical studies that, okay, it's probably going to be from on the order of a few weeks, or at least a week, up to a couple of years. Maybe that's a typical software project. Maybe if we include maintenance and evolution in our definition of a project, we might have to go a little bit longer. But these, all of this type of domain knowledge will always be there. And as both Carlo and Richard mentioned, we can use that to set, uh, you know, sensible priors. And this will help us making computations with our model. And it also is a good use of information because we do know that there are some of these uh, constraints and limits. We, in this step, the plausible step, we can also look at some of the model variables or, or parameters that we're estimating. So maybe we say, if we look at uh, these prior predictive simulations, that it's not realistic that changing a language would lead to a thousand times higher effort or lower effort, right? So we can also put some limits on priors based on looking at these parameters that we will estimate in the end. Um, because we, we know that it's, it's not going to be several orders of magnitude different by difference, maybe by using different languages. Okay, the second step is about can we work with this model? And this is a little bit of a black art. So this is going to be uh, maybe the most difficult for you when you do these things. Uh, because uh, but, but it's important to mention, I think Carlo mentioned this early on, that this is a feature of this workflow and these tools, is that the model will somehow tell you something by being hard to compute with. So you should listen to this. You should not just say, oh, skip it. I don't like this library or I need a faster machine or something. That there is information in the fact that the way you have written your model uh, makes it very hard to use for, for the existing tools. But still, it is more of a black art than the other steps, probably. So just to give you an example, there are many kind of guidelines and help in this, in, in this step, so we can't go into that today. But for example, if your inference step, so you saw now when Richard run, ran this model, it ran in a couple of seconds. And if this is estimated to take several weeks, well, probably your model is too complex and you need to simplify something in it. If the different uh, um, traces that we talked about, so different chains used by these algorithms, if they lead to differences in the result, then there are also tricks that you can sort of change your model to try to avoid this and, and make it easier to work with these models. But, you know, uh, th this is also a black art still, but also the tools we have available becomes better and better. And that makes it easier to work with more complex models on, on larger data sets. And there's also a lot of research on automating this step so that you don't need as much knowledge about how to change the model, how to reparameterize. So um, yeah, automation can help here. Third step is uh, in the third step, we will actually run uh, the model on uh, using our empirical data and judge, is this an adequate description of, uh, of the data that we actually have? So basically, we take the data, we run it, uh, our Bayesian tools, and uh, through our models, and we ask ourselves, do we do the posterior, is that a good way to capture uh, reality, the data that we actually have seen? So it's, it sounds like a kind of uh, cir uh, circular argument here. But of course, this doing this computation and getting the posterior and looking at it can help you detect problems with the computation, with the model, and possibly even with the posterior at some point. That, so how well do they fit together in order to, to be useful for this uh, actual data that you do have? So for example, are there some parts of the data that you actually collected that is not captured by the posterior? So you're basically doing these same plots that Richard showed you, but you're, you're doing it on the posterior you get from actually running uh, the empirical data through that. Uh, so. The good thing here is that the adequate step 
it has many similarities with the plausible step because the difference is that now you have added the data, but the type of checks you can do, both graphical and uh, quantitative, uh, can be uh, quite similar here in this step. Um, okay, so um, the comparison step is when you have at least two models, which model does uh, a thing better, which is important for you in your analysis. And here it becomes uh, often a trade-off. So a simpler model has its benefits. Maybe a more complex model will tend to be more accurate. And there are many tools and metrics for this step. So you will not need to learn so much uh, uh, about the detail, the statistical or mathematical details of all these metrics. There are good uh, tools and there's a lot of actually research on, on particularly this step, how to do this in a good way. So to, to, uh, to find the right trade-off so that we're not overfitting too much, then we can be very accurate, but often the model becomes complex. Uh, but so how do we trade this off in a meaningful way? But it's important to understand that it's, only, it's not only about accuracy in this step. You have to consider also the scientific cost. So a complex model is harder to learn, harder to understand, harder to reason about, and thus makes it a bit harder scientifically to build on. And we see this, of course, in, in traditional sciences like physics and so on. Uh, you know, Newton's model of gravity was fairly good for a long time, and it is still a good model for many contexts, while maybe Einstein's uh, refinements on that is, is more true in a sense and more accurate in many situations, and we need it, but it's not a given that we are only going to use Einstein's models uh, when we found it. Then there are also practical costs, and this I've seen many times in industry myself, so I tend to find that very few companies prefer complex models like deep neural nets or random forests. They want something simple, for example, and we have a similar thing here. So we can also think about this. It's not a given that the most accurate or the best trade-off here is, is uh, always what you should select. You can use other, other criteria to do this selection. And also the cost of having a more complex data because you need to collect and maintain more data in the future, for example. Uh, okay, I guess I, we need to wrap up soon. But very importantly, this is one of the key benefits in the short term, I think, for, for software engineering research. And it is that we can really look at the implications and the practical uh, significance of, of what our results mean. And so the good thing here is that the posterior is a lot of samples from a distribution. And we they so it already includes the uncertainty that we have uh, in our result. So when we simulate from that, this uncertainty will be uh, kept and we will then be able to, um, to answer to practitioners. So here are the interval, here is what you can expect. Here's the probability of different things in, in your practical situation and question. So for example, in if we have this situation of language, uh, a model uh, connecting language, a choice of programming language to product effort, then we can ask specific questions that an industry practitioner might have. So which language should we choose in this new project when we have certain characteristics, for example? Is it cost effective to switch a language given the project cost we have and so on? So you can ask these uh, questions uh, very closely to the needs of, of the users and you can answer them and give the uncertainty in that answer. Um, to do this well, in a sense, we need to ask often the practitioner to, to do estimates, ballpark estimates of the costs involved and so on. And if, if you're interested in this, we have a paper uh, on this that you can find on archive, which is uh, sort of uh, puts these things together and you can use that uh, to see examples of, uh, of how you can actually do these um, practical significance analysis for, for real-world situations. So the scientific uh, output from the posterior is more like these plots of the posterior, so different parameters or elements of our model. In this case, the data we used was comparing um, 
two different testing techniques that you see on the bottom distribution there. And the, those two techniques were traditional test scripts and uh, the other technique was exploratory uh, testing. And then the other factor seen on top there was uh, the experience of the developer or, or tester in this case. So what we can see here is this sort of scientific summary the, of the of the posterior so we can see that it's more important to select the right testing technique because it's further away from zero so it has a stronger effect than it is to to decide on the experience or or to to select the experience of the tester and but then we also do use this for different specific scenarios so in the bottom of this table you can see that we are simulating using this posterior uh, using exploratory testing and highly experienced, so many years of experience. And then we get out uh, the actual expected number of, of, um, of failures or faults that they will identify using exploratory testing, in, of course, in, in a certain time and so on. So we can really um, simulate practical questions and, and answer them to the uh, industrial practitioners. And this is often uh, a little bit harder to do with the output uh, of a typical frequentist uh, analysis. So in some sense, what we are doing in, for practical significance is to do use the posterior for simulations, combine that with estimations or actual measurements of, of real costs or real effects in, in, at the company, and then we can uh, answer very complex questions that are relevant for this practitioner. So final slide. This is more of the scientific value in, in addition to this practical value of doing uh, a real numerical quantitative analysis of practical significance is that we can actually use the posterior from one study can inform and, and help us select the prior for the next one. And in this way, we can much more in a much more nuanced and detailed and quantitative way actually reuse knowledge and build a, a stronger progression in software engineering as a field of science. Okay, thank you. I, I stop there and we can take some final questions. I honestly don't know how much uh, time we have left. We have 10, ten so There minutes. was a question. Uh... Eight. Eight. Okay. okay. Uh, Burak has a question, Robert, regarding how to share posteriors for evidence building. Yeah, of course. I mean, so the, the current way, we can do the current way, which is I, I find your paper, Burak, and I, I read from your tables and then I construct, you know, I guess that it's normally distributed and I, I take uh, the average and maybe the standard deviation if you have them in, in a table and I can create the prior based on that. Uh, but of course, replication packages and, you know, we can actually share our posteriors and you know, here's even a, a benefit in, in sensitive, in using insensitive industrial data, because maybe we don't need to share the data we collected in the company. We can share the outcome of running that data through a model, right? And that could actually, in case we have multiple companies, for example, sharing the posteriors is, uh, is going to be maybe less sensitive. So that there can be benefits in this uh, way of thinking and working, uh, which is, of course, we can do everything <laughs> that we have described with frequentist methods, but you're not always going to find the frequentist method that suits your, your model needs or your data situation, right? Um, but yeah, so, so many, the answer is that we need many of the ideas that are also in the replication reproducibility uh, you know, efforts in, in our community, of course. It's not only about BDA, but BDA makes this natural. It's part of the uh, existing process for doing BDA. That, that way, I think it's more encouraged. Yes. I'm, I might add also that I'm, I'm currently working on a project where they have a family of experiment, experiments. And in this case, they had the data, the raw data. So we have a multi-level model where we basically have another level 
which is the number of experiments that were run. So we assemble all evidence into one big framework, basically, uh, which makes our predictions much better, of course, and, and the uncertainty is controlled in a much better way. Yes, and uh, I mean, we even have a case, we, we haven't been allowed to publish that <laughs> because it's on COVID-19 patients <laughs> that we got from the local hospitals here. Uh, and um, there we could see that uh, a fairly simple linear structure, the Bayesian model, but allowing uh, uh, it to be multi-level, so learning from different hospitals and so on, uh, actually made for a better pre prediction than using very uh, strong machine learning models like random forests and deep neural nets. So, you know, even a, a simpler model form, which is easier to reason about and understand, just by adding the, the flexibility of, of um, considering hospitals as being different and so on, and um, put that linear model ahead of uh, more non-linear and complex existing models. So that, that's an interesting case too. Paolo has a very good question, which is very dear to me, and it's how this is all connected to causality. And uh, I'm working, I've been working with one uh, in one study, but now also another study, where we will look into the causal direct and indirect effects. So the idea here, Paolo, is that we fall back either on uh, Judea Pearl's work uh, when it comes to DAGs, directed acyclic graphs and so on, and use these graphs to validate our statistical models and see if they hold. Or you can go via Schulkopf's and their work and instead uh, have a data-driven approach where, where you don't design the graphs uh, as an expert, but rather look into the data to derive the causality from that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, Lionel has an important question here connecting to building chains of evidence. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, it is my Sorry, view. Can I just quickly add the... Uh... Yes. I, we don't hear you now. We don't Carlo. hear you, Carlo. So um, you continue, Robert, meantime. Okay. Sorry, can you hear me? Now we hear you, yes. Okay. So you wanna go? Now you do? Yeah. No. No, no. no okay, no. Robert, take Leonel's yeah, question. I'll take now you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. Oh my God, sorry. Okay. Yeah, Robert, you take Leonel's okay, okay. question. Yeah, I expected to help Lionel. Uh, of course, maybe I'm naive because uh, <laughs> this is also a sociological change of, of, of a scientific area. But I do think that uh, we, we have a chance because BDA and these techniques, they don't come with the same interpretations and the same way of view, viewing the outcome or, or using them. So I think it is a chance for us to, to, to use this to build stronger chains of evidence. And in some sense, in some sense you wouldn't even need a meta-analysis because if you do learn, if you're the fifth study in that chain of evidence, then the posterior get from the fourth study summarizes all of the four studies. So you don't need to do a meta-analysis of those four studies in order to set the priors for yours. Of course, this is an ideal world and it's gonna be more complex than that. But I do think that the, 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 the possibility here is, is to make this easier because it is already part of the philosophy. Yes, in some sense, the, the priors from, from 20 previous studies uh, and the posterior from, from one study that learns from many of the previous ones, that summarizes what we do know from all of these prior studies, right? It, uh, you know, in theory, of course, there might be differences in, in what these more, how these models build on each other. So, so this makes it more complex. Mm -hmm. do, oh, do you agree uh, with Jordan Carlo? <laughs> no, Leon, Leon has a, uh, could you repeat the Elias question, uh, Robert? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. So, yeah, sorry about that. We have several chat windows. So Lionel asked um, that there's been a failure in the empirical sophronian communities or in sophronian in general to, to, build, to build a body of evidence, to build a body of knowledge based on a, a larger set of studies into the same... Uh, related set of research questions. Can this help? 
And my point was to, to explain this, that uh, yes, I do think it's, it's part of the philosophy of doing Bayesian data analysis to think in terms of how can we set the prior based on the knowledge we have. And in some sense, this could take away the, the need for meta-analysis and so on. Yeah. Okay, he seems uh, happy with that. Oh, and Grace. So I think we are running out of time or already yes. out of time. Sorry, Ash. Uh, yeah, no, we, we are on a yeah. Zoom webinar, so that's not going to terminate abruptly. Right. So I guess, Grace, but, you will, uh, I think you will the, terminate. the recording is. Uh, is uh, Done. Yes, thank you everybody for coming. I'm going to stop the recording because you know how abrupt clutter is when things are over. So uh, yeah. I will stop the recording now so it doesn't look cut. Uh, thank you very, very much. And please feel free to continue the discussion as long as you want. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thanks, Thanks Grace, for everything. Uh, Ashkan.